evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of Susan Weber, the director of the Barth Graduate Center, and Dean Peter Miller, who couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately, I warmly welcome you uh, to the fourth and last uh, meeting, or last of this year's series, um, titled Conservation Conversation. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> conservation conversations. This happens to us quite often. <laughs> um, so I would like to welcome everyone who is here, who is present here at the West 86th Street, but also all of those watching us um, over the web uh, via live stream from all over the world, hopefully. <laughs> conservation conversations are public research dialogues pairing a conservator and a professor um, and exemplifying the goal of cultures of conservation, a five-year uh, curricula curricula in, uh, initiative founded by the NGO W Mellon Foundation. The previous uh, meetings, the previous seminars, um, were concerned with very different topics. We had here um, um, David Bamford, for instance, and Carlo Ginsburg, who were talking on the issues of, uh, who were engaged with the issues of connoisseurship. We also um, invited Giorgio Riello and Sara Scaturo, uh, which were talking about material culture and the materiality of fashion. Uh, the third of those meetings um, uh, were presented by Francesca Bauer and Laurent Olivier, um, and it was concerned with the aspects of early scientific inquiry in archaeology and art and on the visual reconstruction of archaeological time. So tonight, uh, tonight's conversations um, concern a collaborative project presented by um, uh, Judith Olshove Schlanger and um, Michelle Chesner, um, and is entitled Case Study in Collaboration, Conserving Thousands of Lost Medieval Hebrew Manuscripts. I will shortly talk about uh, um, a couple of words about the um, uh, project Cultures of Conservation within which this uh, initiative or the seminar is taking place. Um, at its core, Cultures of Conservation initiative is an attempt to connect the perspective of conservation to an interdisciplinary notion of the human sciences. This refers to the way in which humanities, um, humanities disciplines such as art history, anthropology, archaeology, and history provide complementary means of understanding how human beings live and work uh, in the world. The history of conservation may explain something of why this, its insights have not yet been fully integrated into this uh, academic pursuit, even as the study of materials and materiality has moved to center stage. Uh, yet conservation, in the very best sense, <coughs> conjoins data derived from instrumenta instrumentation and technology, long experience of hand and eye, and scholarly understanding of how and why things were done in order to bring an object back to life. Um, the Cultures of Conservation project aims to work on three levels. We have current students, emerging scholars in the humanities, and conservators. New courses are devoted to conservation perspectives, and augmented existing courses um, link the study of materiality directly to conservation. Now, um, before I will introduce um, Gabriel Berlinger, uh, she will introduce our speakers directly. I just would like to um, tell everyone who is out there that we are available um, also over Twitter, and you can address your tweets um, <laughs> at uh, hashtag Bart Grad Center TV. Um, if you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please um, do this, and we'll try to answer them uh, accordingly. <coughs> and now, please let me introduce you shortly, uh, <laughs> Gabriel Bellinger, um, a research scholar who is here um, at the PGC, um, active within the Initiative Cultures of Conservation. Gabriel Bellinger is a folklorist and ethnologist who draws upon the arts, humanities, and social sciences to study creative expression in everyday life. She holds a PhD and MA in folklore from Indiana University and a BA in anthropology from the University in Pennsylvania. Her work focuses on nature and significance of vernacular architecture. Please welcome uh, Gabby. <laughs> Thank you. Gabby, please introduce. Thank you, Hannah, so much. Um, I'm very pleased to 
be part of this organizing committee tonight for this wonderful lecture. It's a great honor to have these two speakers with us, and I will introduce them each before their, their presentations. Um, the format of the evening, just to get that on the table, will be a brief pres presentations by each of our visitors, and then uh, a dialogue, hopefully an interactive, dynamic dialogue to which all of you can contribute. Um, both speakers will have a chance to respond to each other before we open it up to the forum. And uh, this is really, what's so wonderful is that this event really encapsulates what this whole initiative, the five-year initiative, is aiming for, which is dialogue and constructive exchange between both scholars of humanities and social sciences and conservators or practitioners in the conservation sciences. So tonight's pairing is a really wonderful exemplary case of the, the productive exchange that comes of this kind of collaboration. Uh, the topic for tonight is looking at fragments of Hebrew manuscripts, <coughs> ancient Hebrew manuscripts that have been either intentionally or unintentionally <coughs> distributed in the remaking of other books and manuscripts. And so this is a, in two contexts, this is really interesting, both in the current moment of the digital age when books are you know, becoming less and less material, in fact, it's nice to, to refocus our attention to the material existence, constitution of the actual book, and think about what happens as it does become deconstructed and reconstructed in new forms. And in the context of the Bard Graduate Center, to look at an object, to study the life history or the biography of an object, this is a really interesting case study because we are studying this time span in which the first life, the second life, potentially the third life is, is really demonstrated very clearly. And we can understand what happens as a book travels around the world in various pieces and then comes back together. This topic emerges in collaboration or out of uh, an international research network that was formed in 2009 called Books Within Books. And as of most recently, some 20,000 fragments of Hebrew manuscripts have been identified across Europe and have been brought back together to piece together these original manuscripts that were lost and, and uh, dispersed. These are fragments of medieval manuscripts that were preserved by chance in book bindings and wrappers of files to be found in various libraries, archives, and museums across Europe. So this is very painstaking and time intensive work to, to reconstruct them. And here we're really looking at the deconstruction of books that became <coughs> reconstructed and now are deconstructed again to reconstruct <laughs> a history of both the book and the people <coughs> whom it represents and who used it. So there's a really interesting connection between the material construction and the historical construction. So um, to begin our conversation, Judith Schlanger is Director d'Etudes in the Historical and Philological Sciences section of the École Pratique des Hautes Etudes. She received the Maîtrise d'Etudes Modernes from the Institut National de Langue et Civilisation Orientale in Paris, and uh, a Diplôme en Langue Sémitique Ancienne from the École des Langues Orientales Anciennes at the Institut Catholique <coughs> in Paris, a PhD from the Faculty of Oriental Studies at the University of Cambridge, and a habilitation à diriger des recherches in University of Paris. Her research interests include Hebrew manuscripts, paleography, and diplomatic Hebrew, the history of medieval linguistic thought, the Cairo Geniza, and Hebrew Christians in the Middle Ages. She has many publications to speak of, um, amongst which are Dictionnaire du Latin Français de la Bible Hébrique de la Bède de Ramsey and uh, several co-edited volumes, as well as the Carrie tradition of Hebrew grammatical thought in its classical form, a critical edition and English translation, um, and Carrie marriage documents from the Cairo Geniza, legal tradition and community life in medieval Egypt and Palestine. So without further ado, Judith Schlanger will thank begin you. <coughs> thank you very much for your introduction. I would like to thank all those present here, and especially Bard College and Peter Miller, who unfortunately cannot be with us uh, and now for his invitation, and this opportunity to speak about Hebrew manuscripts, but not really Hebrew manuscripts, but tiny little fragments. Why to deal with tiny little fragments? It's such <coughs> a wonderful opportunity to explain to you 
why we study this particular type of sources. Uh, we are going to talk about, about a project, a project which is a collaboration between researchers in manuscript studies, paleographers, codicologists, historians of the text, the keepers of libraries, as well as specialists of manuscripts conservation. So there are three different type of people, specialists, involved in this particular project. The project, as Gabi has so kindly introduced it, is called Books Within Books and deals with about 20,000 fragments of manuscripts that have been identified so far, fragments which are preserved in European libraries, but since last year, two years ago, uh, we have started a collaboration with Michelle Chesner, and I'm very happy that she's here, that we are going finally to be able to, to discuss between us about this project. The project which will include, so our project will include as well this side of the ocean with the wonderful collection of Hebrew fragments in Columbia University. So Michelle is going to talk about it later. Um, I think that in order to continue, I'd like to show you uh, a few slides and uh, uh, maybe we'll begin by the website of the project. <laughs> yeah, should be here. No, Just this go is yours. to the first. Uh, Sorry, I haven't been to I don't know. Is it? It's that one. That one? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <coughs> So Books Within Books, it's a project which, uh, which makes work together 13 different partners in most European, European countries. Excuse me, I have to log in again. Yeah, I have just taken one of the examples of the manuscripts described in our website. So Books Within Books, 13 different uh, countries, 13 different partners. In each country, there are several scholars, young scholars, researchers, postdoctoral researchers, and doctoral students working on the description of the manuscripts. However, before we describe the manuscripts, it is important to identify them. We are dealing with the collections which have not been catalogued. The fragments have been reused. We are going to talk about the reuse and recycling of manuscripts. They have been reused in different functions to strengthen or to, to, or to, to bind other books, manuscripts, but also early printed books. So these manuscripts are not a part of the library units. They are simply raw material which have been used to make it better, to make better or to protect the manuscript. As such, they are not catalogued. It's very rare that catalogues mention the presence of these documents. So the aim of our work is first of all to identify, to preserve this fragile heritage from oblivion and to enable scholars to access these sources because despite the very fragmentary state of preservation, they are extremely important for reconstructing the literary history, but also the history of Jewish communities in Europe. So <coughs> how do we work? First of all, we try to get in touch with the keepers of the collections. In most European countries, like here, Michelle, the keepers of collections are highly trained professionals scholars who usually know perfectly well what their collections contain. As scholars, we have no access to the collections as such. It is very rare that we can obtain a permission to go to the stacks. It happens often in the archives, but almost never in libraries, and just browse through the books on the shelves. So we have not such a possibility. 
So it's absolutely essential that we work with keepers of the collections who know what, what is on the shelves, in the collections, and have <coughs> access, quick access to, to the bookshelves. Otherwise, it would mean that we have to order every single book just to open it and to check whether there is a Hebrew fragment in this book. So the first stage of our work is working with the keepers of collection to identify the objects themselves, the books which contain Hebrew fragments. Uh, often we write simply a general circular letter that we send to different collections. It works very well in Switzerland. We send a letter through the, uh, through the um, association of the Swiss librarians and we receive answers. The librarians write to us, yes, we would like to participate in your project. Yes, we have one, two, three fragments in our library. Please come, identify the fragments, and you will be most welcome to put it on your website. Today, we have described about 2,000 fragments since 2009 on our website, and we have identified almost two, two, uh, 20,000 fragments all over Europe. So this work, uh, this works very well. How do we, so the, the next stage is of course the access to the particular manuscript which, <coughs> which has, been, has, been, uh, has been identified by the keepers of the collection. Well, sometimes we simply ask the keepers to organize the systematic search for the fragments. We work in collaboration with the keepers of collection. We did it for instance for the, for the library of the University of Krakow in Poland we have asked the keeper of the collection to go to the stacks, to go to the bookshelves, to open every single book and to tell us. And uh, they have been paid for it by a special funding and it worked very well. About 300 Hebrew fragments were discovered in manuscript and early printed books in one single collection in Krakow with the advantage that uh, we know that most of the manuscripts bound in uh, bound manuscripts which exist in this collection today, which are preserved in this collection today, were bound in the workshops of 15th and 16th century University of Krakow. So we have quite a clear idea about the origin of the fragments, where the <coughs> fragments come before they were reused. So it was a very important collection. So sometimes we work with the keepers in a very proactive way. We just ask them to do this work for us. The next stage is to describe the manuscripts. We deal with 20,000 fragments, so of course an enormous amount of manuscript. Describing a fragment is a very difficult task. Describing a manuscript ne necessitates specific skills, the knowledge of codicology, paleography, book history, textual history, manipulation of different sources, different databases today, which makes the, the work much easier. However, the work on the fragments is even more difficult. Here, the materiality <coughs> of, the, of the Hebrew book and the knowledge of its material aspect, what we call the archaeology of the book, is extremely important because it is much more difficult to reconstruct the history of the book and of the context where the book was produced when you deal with a tiny little fragment. And you can do it only through the reconstruction of the form. You reconstruct the form through the traces that the fragment bears on it the form of the book, whether it was a scroll, whether it was a codex, a document, just one page, whether it comes from a, from a bifolio, and so on and so forth. And you can as well identify the place, potential place, and the time when the fragment was produced through the paleography and codicology of the fragment. So here, the knowledge of the materiality of the text and the techniques of production and paleography becomes even more essential that when you deal with uh, full manuscripts. That's why it's extremely important that people working on this, project, uh, uh, on this project are fully trained in Hebrew paleography, which is not easy because there are not many places in the world where such a training can be, uh, can be um, given. So there are, as I told you, there are scholars, postdoctoral researchers, and doctoral students working on the description of, on the, of the manuscripts. They go to specific places, to specific archives, libraries, with training that they have received. Mostly they are our doctoral students, so they are trained in paleography and codicology. Uh, and then they describe every single fragment. Here you have an example of a scroll 
Torah scroll from Cavaillon. There is only one fragment in this collection. Uh, you, have, you find, first of all, the name of the person who described, who described the, the manuscript. It's extremely important for us in our database that the names, the authorship of the descriptions is acknowledged. Every single, every single description works like a separate <coughs> research project. It involves quite a lot of research on the text, on the manuscript <coughs> itself, and full credit has to be given to the person who described the manuscript. So every single, every single description has an author. The description contains the identification of the text, the nature of the text, whether it's a biblical text, a commentary, Talmudic text, a liturgy, and so on and so forth. Then we try to identify the text with more precision, given the precise place, chapter, uh, verse, and so on and so forth, um, the contents. Um, then we try to date the manuscript to give an estimate date. Usually we give it just to, to in the brackets of 100 years. It is not very precise, but for Hebrew manuscript, it's quite, it's quite okay because there is, especially for square manuscripts, the scribes of square calligraphic manuscripts tend to imitate the models that they follow. So the Hebrew script has this particularity of not changing much throughout centuries. Of course, there is a change. We can differentiate between Oriental, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, or Italian script. But finer definition is sometimes very difficult, both because of the conservative transmission of the manuscript, but also because of the state of the Hebrew paleography. We don't have enough tools for the time being. One of the aims of this project is to create such a tool for a finer definition, dating, and localization of Hebrew manuscripts. So there is quite a detailed um, codicological description of the fragment. We try to define not only its place in the book, but also the nature, codicological nature, whether it's a document, bifolio, on, and so on, so on and so forth. The state of conservation, whether it's a full page or just a, a part of a page, a little strip of parchment, and so on and so forth. Codicological details of book production, like ruling, um, pricking in the margins, and all the technicalities of the production of the books, justification of the margins, which is extremely important for dating manuscripts. The text layout and the page layout, two different things. We describe it, then the, um, the parchment, the ink, the script, and finally, all kinds of elements which can help us to trace the history of the manuscript, like additional glosses, marginalia, uh, stamps, signatures, Latin annotations or other annotations, and so on and so forth, which do not belong to the original text, but which are paratextual elements which indicate the history of the manuscript. And then we try as well to describe the volume as such, the binding, if possible, and the volume, the volume in which the Hebrew fragment is used, because we believe that it is one of the most important elements which informs us about the circulation of the manuscripts. It's a terminus ad quem, of course the manuscript is earlier than the binding, so the binding gives us an additional information about the dating and the place of the manuscript, but also it allows us to follow the circulation of Hebrew manuscripts. And with the circulation of the manuscripts, we can try to reconstruct the circulation of people and ideas. So all these elements are extremely important. This is why, unlike some, some, um, some previous projects, we do not tend to detach the fragments from its original binding. We do it only if the text justifies it, an unknown commentary where we can see only one side of it. Of course, we'll try to detach the, the fragment to see what is on the other side. But if we have yet another fragment of a Talmud or Bible, even if, if we know that every fragment is important and may contain important textual differences and information, we do not ask the libraries to detach the fragment unless the binding has to be conserved anyway. So we don't do it unless these are specific types of binding, and I'm going to, to talk about it a little bit later. So 
this is, uh, this is the description of the manuscript. And then we have a series of images that should open, I hope will open, that you can, you can play with, you can, you can make it bigger and, uh, and see, uh, see <coughs> the script and study the paleography. So for each description, we have as well a series of, of images. So this is the short, oh sorry, I would like to go back to the PowerPoint. Is it yours or is it mine? Yes, that was yours. The, the this one, one, the top one. Yes. Okay, great. So now I would like to go back to, um, if, if it is, okay. oops. Right, thank you, <laughs> thanks a lot, <laughs> yes. <coughs> so now I would like to go back to to the question that we are dealing with, the, the, the reuse of Hebrew manuscripts in the bindings. These are not Hebrew manuscripts, reassure <laughs> yourselves, <laughs> that's not that, but we are going to talk about the recycling and the death of the manuscript. You see, what we, what we do, we, we deal with manuscripts which are out of use, which were destroyed. In order to be reused in a paradoxical way, the manuscripts have to be destroyed first, yes? And it is through the destruction that they have been preserved. It's absolutely amazing, because otherwise these manuscripts, are the rest of the manuscripts not available. What happens, we have just one little fragment. This fragment used to be a book, but the rest of the book usually does not exist, unless under the form of another fragment in another volume, sometimes in a completely different library in a different country. So recycling, of course it's ecologically correct today to speak about the recycling of the books. I have brought this image just to tell you, I don't have the, 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 the numbers for this country, but in France, about 100 million books, sometimes even unopened, are recycled, are ground to pulp every year. So it's an amazing amount of, uh, so every time you have your takeaway pizza, think about <laughs> the book it comes from. It can be a Bible, or it can be Kant or anything. So anyway, the recycling is an, it's an old practice and apparently a practice which has lots of future in our economically oriented world. But economics, economical reasons were behind the recycling of, of the books in the Middle Ages as well. There is absolutely no ideology behind recycling. We cannot say that Latins recycled Hebrew manuscripts because these were Hebrew manuscripts all kind of manuscripts were recycled. Hebrew fragments are just a part of the manuscripts which were recycled throughout the centuries. So there is no ideology behind. The reasons are economic. Why throw away the, a good, strong piece of parchment where it can be reused? And reuses are multiple. Using in the book bindings is just one of the ways that it can be, uh, it can be reclaimed and reused as a raw material for something else. However, the circumstances of making these manuscripts available, availability of manuscripts, this, <coughs> can, this is something which has to do with the history of the Jewish people as far as Hebrew manuscripts are concerned. So first of all, there is the history of the Jewish people, of Jewish communities as, uh, themselves. This is a much later and maybe not such a wonderful um, painting from Poland. Uh, it uh, depicts the expulsion of the Jews in a little town of Świdnica in 1454. You can see from the style of the painting that it was it's a much later, much later uh, painting. However, what is important here, you see the edict of expulsion, the soldiers uh, dressed in medieval clothes, uh, armors, expelling the Jews and the Jews running away they run away holding their books, yes? And also, when you, when you read the chronicles about the expulsion of the Jews from England in 1290, the description of the Jews contains the description of the books. The Jews were expelled cum libris suis, with the books. Mm -hmm. So the only element that they carried, which was mentioned by the Latin chronicle, <coughs> are the books. So we have this impression that the books followed the Jews in the, in the difficult, um, difficult fate. And indeed, we know, well, we <coughs> realize when we work on the bindings that 
it was a current practice. It did not depend on expulsions. It's not that, that Jewish manuscripts were reused only when the Jews were expelled from a specific town. However, there are several examples of the increase in the number of reused, available, existent, extant um, reused books after specific events. For instance, one of the earliest reused Hebrew fragments, a um, fragment of Slichot from a prayer book, um, which, uh, which was preserved in a binding, 12th century binding, from Pembroke College in Cambridge, comes from Bury St. Edmunds. There are about 50 bindings, early 12th century bindings from Bury St. Edmunds. They are, we don't know precisely when they were made, but we know that they are 12th century wooden bindings with a paste down, with fragments which were pasted to the, to the wooden, wooden boards of the bindings. The Hebrew fragment, of <coughs> course, when we think about this kind of binding from the 12th, 12th century, we immediately think about, about the expulsion of the Jews from Bury St. Edmunds in 1190. So obviously there was an event where 57 Jews were killed, there was a massacre, and afterwards they were expelled by the abbot of, uh, of uh, Bury St. Edmunds, whose name was Samson, who was indebted to the Jews, so everybody knows why they were expelled. Similar things can be traced in, uh, in the Polish collection I told you about. There is an increase in the number of manuscripts, which are Hebrew manuscripts, which were, which were reused in, in the years 1410, 1420. And we know that in 1407, there was again a massacre, problems, accusations, uh, which started as a neighbor's problem when the University of Krakow built their they, they, they house, the hall of residence, in the Jewish quarter. And then suddenly we have this increase in the number of manuscripts. And the, the, the most important typical example is the reuse of Talmud manuscripts in Italy. The, there is really a, a, an increase by about 70% of the number of Talmudic manuscripts among Italian bindings. I should mention here that the quarter, uh, sorry, the three quarters of the fragments that we ha have today come from Italy, about 15,000 fragments. This is really a huge amount of, uh, of manuscripts. So in Italy, there is a huge increase of, uh, of use of Talmudic documents by the end of 16th century. In Italy, we can follow very well the reuse of manuscripts because they were often reused as wrappers <coughs> for the files of the notaries or ecclesiastical archives and the date of, of the reuse is clearly marked on the manuscript, on the binding. So we can easily follow year by year the reuse of manuscripts. And we realize that in the 60s, from the 60s of the 16th century, there are lots of Talmudic manuscripts. And of course we know that uh, after, after the mid, uh, mid 16th century, there were lots of polemics against the Talmud, which ended up by a burning of the, of the Talmud in Campo di Fiori in 1553. So fortunately, not all the Talmuds were burned. Some of them were reused, as we can see. But there is clearly a historical event which led to the availability somewhere of the books. So there is this, this question about, about the, the Jewish communities. Some people talk as well about the invention of printing. The manuscripts are less less important while, when the books can be reproduced in many copies. I am personally a bit skeptical about, I think that it's too simple as an explanation because we know that after the invention of printing, as far as Jewish manuscripts are concerned, there were even more manuscripts copied by hand than before. So there is not a clear cut end of, of manuscripts and the use of manuscripts and copying production of manuscripts with the invention of printing. It took several several dozens of, of years, even hundreds of years, to, so for, for, the man, for the printed book, books to replace the manuscripts. What is important, however, I think, is the attitude to old books and writings among the Jews. There is a general idea that the Jews respect the old books because of the institution of the Geniza. I think that we have all heard about the Cairo Geniza the Geniza, the institution of the Geniza as such, shall I explain it? Or everybody knows about the Geniza, yes? Um, institution which was born in late antiquity, which prevents the books which went out of use 
from, from profanation. The books which are used in liturgy have to be stored in a specific place, possibly buried in a cemetery. These books are, are to be protected from profanation for religious reasons, but not from destruction. I think that this is something that we have to bear in mind. The Geniza does not protect the books from the natural destruction through natural agents. So it does show the respect, religious respect for the books, but it does not show a respect for a book as an object. It will disappear. It is, it is bound to disappear. The archives, how long the Jewish family or Jewish synagogue or Jewish institution kept archives in the Middle Ages? Um, again, here we can talk about the Cairo Geniza rather than European situation because in Europe, we have absolutely no traces of Jewish institutional archives, except for some places in Spain, and especially the collection in Girona um, hi historical archives, a part of our project Books Within Books, where we have discovered quite a few fragments from the Pinkas team, from the register books of the community, and we can talk about the existence of community archives. However, we don't know what was the, let's say, shelf life, the length of the, the lifespan of a document in Jewish tradition. Whether there was the idea of keeping the documents for posterity, certainly not. Probably once out of use, you know, a ketubah, it's, it's, it's a document which has to serve the woman for, for her lifetime, but maybe as well her heirs after her death. But it's not a document that that has a, a legal usage for a longer period. So once out of use, the documents would go to the Geniza probably. So there is not this idea of keeping, of keeping <coughs> old, um, old documents. And here I have, I am very happy to, 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 uh, to have Professor uh, Kalbach, Elisheva Kalbach among us, because I have brought the quotation from her wonderful book, Policies of Time, which is the quotation from a Kabbalist, David Ben Isaac of Fulda, the author of, uh, uh, of Migdal David, a Kabbalistic work. So he talks about the sources on which he based his Kabbalistic work. Some I have found in old books, this is the translation that I have taken from Elisheva's book, written hundreds of years ago, <coughs> some on single pages, torn and crumbling parchments, strewn on the ground, trampled underfoot by all who see them but do not appreciate them who consider them worthless. I retrieved them from the reuse heap and by uplifting and embracing them, established them as my own. So you see here the idea, he, he complains about the lack of importance of these fragments among his fellow people. He talks about reuse heap. He talks about the fragments. He did exactly what we are doing today. So there is as well the question of attitude. And then the reuse. So you, you reuse, the, there, there are several ways of reusing documents in the, in the Middle Ages. You can use it as scrap paper or scrap par parchment to make notes, to fill up the white pages or blank spaces on the manuscript. You can use it as a palimpsest, like this one. This is a Cairo Geniza palimpsest, but we have as well palimpsest from European Geniza. Um, you can use it in various types of bindings or for lining of various objects. Uh, here you have an example of, of a viola, of a musical instrument, which is lined from inside with fragments of writings, and two of them, I don't think you can see it from here, two of them are Hebrew manuscripts. So there are several ways of reusing manuscripts. I told you about the notaries wrappers. Here you have a full shelf from the Archivio di Stato of Bologna. You can see these are, these are files of the notaries which were made of Hebrew manuscripts. Sometimes the Hebrew writing was erased from the outside so that they look blank, but on the inside you can still see the Hebrew writing, but sometimes the writing is available. Sometimes the, the, the fragments were taken, taken out of the bindings in modern libraries, especially by the end of the of the 19th century during the conservation of the manuscripts. In most cases, unfortunately, there was no note taken of the manuscript from which 
the fragment was, was taken. Here you have an example from Bibliothèque Nationale de France. It's a ketuba, a marriage contract from the 15th century from Avignon. Uh, it is kept as a document, separate document. It's only by looking at the traces left on the, on the parchment that you can see that it was used as an outer wrapper for a book. You can reconstruct the dimensions of the <coughs> book and you can see how, how it worked. Sometimes there are, the Hebrew manuscripts are used as fly leaves for, of manuscripts or incunabula or early printed books. This is another example of a beautifully decorated prayer book from Krakow used as a fly leaf of a manuscript. Here again. Or you can, very often, Hebrew fragments were used as paste down. They were simply glued to the wooden boards of the um, of the manuscripts, of the bindings. As you can see, sometimes several different manuscripts were used for this purpose, glued one on the top of the other. Sometimes tiny little stripes were used to strengthen the choirs, especially for paper manuscripts. Uh, you know, when you stitch the choir, the place where you make holes to stitch the choirs, little, little choirs of the paper manuscripts, is very fragile because the thread tears the paper. So the, the little stripes of parchment are inserted <coughs> in order to strengthen this point of stitching. And we get to the last example. I think that I, I have just two minutes, no? Uh, I think you are fine, yes. Yeah, yeah I'm fine? Typical. OK, great. So we are coming to the last example, the bindings which were made of paper, reused paper manuscripts. This is the most tricky example because in order to make a binding from a paper manuscript in the Middle Ages, they used to make a kind of papier mache or a cardboard from up to 50 different folios of paper glued with uh, vegetal glue together to obtain a, 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 hard, a, a hard card, cardboard. And then this cardboard was used to create the binding. This is an example, uh, a paper by volume from a man moneylender's account, which is dated 1324, which probably comes from Avignon, from southern France. And there are more than 30 pages coming from one binding discovered in Krakow, but a book was bound somewhere in southern France, probably in Avignon. Here I have given you just an example how it looks like when you, when you see this, this cardboard where the glue is no longer fresh. So sometimes you see how these different, different pages of paper detach themselves from, from each other. So what do you do in this case? If you have enough energy, <coughs> collaboration from the library, from the keepers and conservationists, you simply detach these fragments. Anyway, these kind of bindings have to be renewed at some point because they are usually in a very bad, sh bad shape. So these one are conserved. After tests, you see here the tests made on ink and paper. Medieval inks and papers are extremely tough. The paper can be put in water and it will not disintegrate, unlike modern papers, which become pulp. <clears throat> so once we make a test on the, uh, on the paper and ink, uh, we can safely put this kind of binding in purified water with 30% of alcohol to keep the ink and simply the water will take away the glue. The pages will separate. You see how easily it is then with a little scalpel, with a little knife to separate page after page and put it to dry. Sometimes when, the, when we are not sure about the paper, we simply put a wet towel on top of the, of the manuscript to disintegrate the glue, as you can see it here. These are pictures coming from the Girona, uh, Girona Historical Archive. Here, we were dealing with modern, let's say modern binding, 19th century from Morocco. The paper was already so bad that we couldn't use the previous techniques, so the page by page was simply simply wet with with a with a, with a cotton cotton wool and the uh, solution of water. 
and then painstakingly separate it. You can see how, how the pages can be separated afterwards. Here again, we are back in Girona with this conservation work, obtaining, obtaining pages from the manuscripts. So, uh, I will stop here. Of course, we could talk about several discoveries, statistics, what we have discovered, but I wanted today to talk about the fragments and about how we get to study them and what is the process of study, conservation, and what is the use of this kind of project. So although we deal only with little fragments, but as I, as I said from the beginning, every fragment was a book, and the study of every single fragment allows us to reconstruct an imaginary shelf of an imaginary or virtual library of the Jewish communities in the Middle Ages. Thank you, and please, Michel. <laughs> present Michelle Chesner. She's the Norman E. Alexander Librarian for Jewish Studies at Columbia University. She received a BA in History from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, an MA in Hebrew and Judaic Studies from New York University, and a Master's of Library Science with a Certificate in Rare Book and Special Collections from Long Island University. Prior to her current position, she was Judaica Public Services Librarian and Archivist at the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. The most recent exhibition at Columbia University Library was entitled People in the Books, Hebrew Manuscripts from Columbia University Libraries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, of course, to, to the Bard Graduate Center for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here. Um, and thank you to Professor, Professor Schlanger. I have learned a tremendous amount just from sitting next to you So and, <laughs> and made some notes in my, <laughs> in, in my talk. Um, Columbia University is a recent collaborator with the Books Within Books project. We're really just just beginning um, to, to be part of this, and we're very proud to be a part of this project and very much look forward um, to sharing and learning from the scholars connected to it. Um, I have to start <coughs> off with a disclaimer that I am not trained in paleography and codicology, and many of the dates that you will see um, I did not date the manuscripts that I'll be describing, um, but we're, as I go continue to learn about the collection um, that we have at Columbia, dates are changing and moving, and um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. So I, I just want to say that some of them, consider them approximate, um, unless un otherwise indicated. Uh, at a recent, so I guess I'll just go there. At a recent lecture um, discussing <coughs> at Columbia University, discussing the European Geniza, um, the the binding fragments project, Professor Mauro Parani called Columbia's collection of binding fragments a diasporic one, as one across the Atlantic um, from the European collections being described. I considered this an apt description as our collection exemplifies many different kinds of binding fragments, which come from many different kinds of collections in different times and places. I think, as Professor Schlanger said, um, s the bindings were sort of localized. You could identify the Gironis, for instance, or the Italian ones as a certain type, and, and I feel that because our collection came from all sorts of places, it, it has a bunch of different um, examples, and I'll try to show that. All of our binding fragments came to Columbia in the 1930s or earlier. The earliest acquisition of binding fragments that we can trace was a donation by Stephen Wise in 1900. Um, the majority of our binding fragments came from the Viennese book dealer, David Frankel, who sold a collection of about 700 manuscripts to Columbia in 1933. Um, subjects found within the binding fragments include Bible and Bible commentary, liturgy, philosophy, Kabbalah, Mishnah, uh, sermons, and Talmud commentary. Unlike many of the binding fragments found in Europe, um, and I'll have to, <laughs> that's, sorry, um, as I said, I had to change. Um, most, rather like some of them, um, most of the known Columbia binding fragments 
uh, were not found in situ. They were rather removed from their context prior to acquisition, which I now understand was very common. Um, and considering that they came in, they came prior at the early 20th century and prior, um, that would make sense considering the mm -hmm. conservation. Um, we know that these manuscripts were used for bindings only because of their distinctive folds or cuts or glue residue, but with a couple of exceptions, we don't have any reference to the books that they were used to form. By matching manuscripts to uh, others documented within the books, within the books, within books projects, we're hoping to find more context for our orphaned binding fragments, in addition to, of course, the ultimate goal of re-piecing the original codices uh, from whence they came. The following examples will show us the variety of binding fragments at Columbia and describe the critical need for collaboration in identifying and cont contextualizing these manuscripts. I'm gonna just ask for the David Frankel, the Viennese book dealer who sold this manuscript to Columbia, dated it to 11th century France. And Isaac Mendelssohn, who cataloged it in the 1940s, retained this dating. If this was indeed the case, it would have been one of the oldest, if not the oldest, fragments of the well-known commentator, Rashi, in existence. There are currently no Rashi manuscripts dating to the 11th century. However, Based on discussions with contemporary scholars and ex experts in the study of Hebrew script, I found that it is mo I'm sorry, much more likely that the manuscript was produced in the 13th or 14th centuries. And this is just an example of the kind of collaboration that could happen. Well, it was a bit disappointing to know that we didn't have the oldest Rashi fragment in existence. <laughs> I was very glad to come to an accurate date for the manuscript, thanks to the international scholarly community. The manuscript does have variants from the currently accepted text, however, and it would be just as wonderful, if not more so, if we could find other pieces from this broken codex. This is, of course, exactly what the Books Within Books project was created to facilitate. The still extent, extant binding of this manuscript is made from several paper leaves bound together to form the boards of this book. And you can see here, all of these layers are actually part of the binding. Um, and you see at the bottom too where it's, where it's obviously layers that were bound together, as was described earlier. David Frankel, our 1930s book dealer, indicated that it was from an old Persian Geniza in, the, in his catalog, and it seems similar to the style of binding used by the Jewish binders in, in Girona, as described, and this is just a close-up we have here of the same images, I've just turned them so you could see the actual Hebrew words from the manuscript. And it's a Hebrew manuscript where the binding was used by, um, as to quote Professor Parani, scores of folios glued together to obtain the court cardboard of the bindings. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, these images did not show up, but thanks to a different international collaboration with the National Library of Israel, who has digitized some of the, our manuscripts. You can take a look at this manuscript, which again was dated to the 10th century. I would be unsure about that without having an expert look, look at it. Um, and again, this is, this is where we really need this project. Um, and you see, um, there's one image. I didn't pull that up in advance. Oh dear, and it timed me out, so I'm just gonna have to leave it. Um, where you see the folds, they're similar to what was shown earlier, how there was a fold on the manuscript where it was used uh, for binding. So I'm just gonna skip through those uh, as well. Hopefully this one we might be able to pull up quickly. Again, thanks to the National Library of Israel. Depending on how fast it loads. Another, manus another uh, binding fragment, a 14th century leaf from uh, containing Abraham ibn Ezra's commentary on Psalms. And you can see here the, the glue, 
the residue left. Oh. You can try to see <laughs> the residue left from the glue that was that was on the um, on the manuscript, and we'll see some more examples of that. So, so I'll try and come back to the original. So there we go. Do you wanna pull me back up? Thank you. To fit the pages of the books being bound, um, as, again, as we saw in previous examples, manuscripts were often sliced in half, as shown here, perhaps to create a necessary thickness to strengthen the binding. The bifolio, the bifolios weren't actually separated, and here you see the glue, and that was the extent to which I could open it because of because the glue was still holding the the manuscript together. Um, but this this little collection of I called it pamphlets, includes the original bifolio uh, of the manuscript. They just simply sliced all the way across and then glued it together to create the thickness for the manuscript. Um, and in this slide, you can see actually the, the paper that was glued on for the binding of that manuscript, the paper residue from the original binding, from that, that binding that it was used for. Like so many of the binding fragments, this manuscript is interesting for scholarly study um, as well. It comes from a 14th century Provençal uh, codex of Jacob and Abba Mari's, Mari Anatoly's Malmad Talmudin, um, a book of sermons which cites many of the classical philosophers, including Plato, Aristotle, Averroes, and others. And this author was actually known for his translations of these philosophers' works into Hebrew. This manuscript was probably written within 100 years of Anatoly's death uh, in 1256. There are about 10 manuscript, copies of this manuscript from the 14th century extant, uh, all of which are in Europe. Um, and so this then is the only 14th century copy of this manuscript in the United States. I actually just <laughs> identified it this week when preparing for this talk, it was listed in our catalog as Drashot, which is just sort of sermons or, or commentaries, the quote, most generic explanation you have. So now um, this can be used for scholarly research, which is very exciting. This incunable <coughs> was printed in Venice in 1493, uh, Terence's Comedies. It's one of our few examples of of a Hebrew manuscript that's still bound to its book in Columbia's collection. Although I'm beginning to think that we have quite a few more than we thought. It's just a matter of getting the curators to look through every single book, as I'll describe in a few minutes. The manuscript contains a portion of the Bible beginning Exodus 17.8, uh, and this particular leaf actually wraps around the whole book. So you could see that it goes through. That's through to the spine and comes around to the back. Um, for a cleaner look, the binder made sure that the blank side was on top, making the text a bit difficult to, to identify, but modern tools like Photoshop allowed me to reverse the text and darken it, <laughs> so I was able to identify it pretty easily. Um, shortly after this book was exhibited in the fall of 2012 in the People in the Books exhibit, I received an email from a scholar interested in early Torah text. Torah scrolls. Um, I'm not positive that this is actually from a Torah scroll because I don't see the crowns, although that's, that could still make it a Torah scroll. Um, she mentioned how she wished that there would be a database where people could post images from fragments of early Torah scrolls, forming a collaborative community that would compare and contrast various examples of these studies with these of studies of these texts. Of course, this is exactly what the Books Within Books project is trying to do. And we're constantly discovering uh, binding fragments. This Ashkenazic liturgical fragment, probably from a Maksor, um, was found in another incunable, um, another Latin incunable, which the, uh, our curator for medieval and Renaissance manuscripts, Consuelo Dutchke, emailed me one day and said, oh, I found these fragments in the manuscript, in the incunable when I was describing it. 
And it's, it's so much of an awareness where she was doing a descriptive cataloging for this book and she said, well, I want to identify every single part of this rare book, so can you please tell me what this might be that I even knew that this existed? And so the, the importance of communication is, is so paramount um, and, and to have that ability to have somebody actually go book by book through the, through the manuscripts to find this is, is really a great gift. Um, I'm just gonna end with a similar case. Uh, I'm sorry, this was an, the, other, the other side of the manuscript that Consuelo found. Um, this was a similar case that happened at the Henry, Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, they actually posted all of their binding fragments, mostly Latin, in a, Flickr, in a Flickr album, and they found that there were some manuscripts found in Hebrew. Um, and again, because of the possibility for interna international communication and collaboration, they were able to <coughs> trace, they were able to A, identify the manuscripts, and then actually trace it um, to an uprising in Frankfurt uh, against the Jews where, where manuscripts were then confiscated and used in binding. Um, so th there's so much potential, and I would say, within the United States, bringing bringing uh, U.S. collections into this project is really such a great um, opportunity for us to be able to continue to add add to this corpus. After all, so many of our manuscripts did come from Europe <laughs> in in their various ways, for better or worse. Um, so so this is, so we really are very excited to be able to to take part in this. Speakers, the first chance to respond to each other's presentations before opening up to the, the group. So, do you have a question? Well, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that it's a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Our project is at its beginnings, and I think that uh, indeed it would be very nice to, to continue this work. Uh, as you say, the source of the, of the manuscripts is the same. Uh, for many years, the scholars in, in Europe um, had this dream about discovering a Geniza comparable to the Cairo Geniza. There is no comparable Geniza, medieval Geniza in, in Europe. There are a few Genizot from later periods, from 18th century in Germany, Moravia, uh, Alsace recently, but we have nothing comparable to the, uh, to the Cairo Geniza. But now we have, because although this reuse of the books is a completely different phenomenon, the result is very similar. And I'm very happy that you have this enormous, wonderful source here in the United States, <coughs> and we'll be able to work together. <laughs> well, we can open it up to the group. If you <coughs> Thank you very much. That was a, a wonderful perspective, a twin perspective on similar problems. And I, I'm just kind of struck the way the, the history of this project in some ways plays my understanding of <coughs> the history of what we now call archaeology. I think a lot about the 18th century, of course, it wasn't really archaeology, it was treasure hunting. You know, you're looking in the ground for things that you can take out where it came from, might be a footnote, but you want the thing, right? But now, obviously, there's been a shift to thinking of this as a contextual evidence of some historical process and we're as interested in how it got to that piece of ground. So I just wonder if I could ask uh, either of you, um, what, if you had to name one discovery of the first kind, simply something wonderful <coughs> and expected that's emerged as an independent thing out of this recovery process, sort of like gems that came out of the Cairo Geniza, <coughs> what would you name? And then secondarily, what would you name as something that you've, you've been able to see as a, as a as a trace of a historical connection or pattern. You mentioned some of the events that gave rise to the general use of manuscripts, but are there any cases where you can say the fact that this one appears here and the other half of it appears in another library tells a story that we would never have known otherwise? So those are two questions, I guess. <coughs> Yes, we had, uh, as far as the gems, we had already the commentary of, uh, of Jacopo Amatoli that, uh, that, that, that Michelle has presented, that's certainly one of the gems. It's very
very difficult to give you just one. Um, <laughs> y y th there is as well Jacob of uh, Sons, published by Judith Cogel, working on, uh, on, uh, on about 500 fragments from Colmar, from Alsace, Alsace a completely unknown, uh, unknown commentary. So there are several, several rabbinical texts. There are, there are several um, commentaries on the on the Sefer uh, Mordechai, for instance, which were not known before, there are some translations of uh, of texts like uh, like in Italy we have uh, we have some some grammatical texts, translations of um, uh, of Kitab al Usul, of Ibn Janakh, an unknown translation into Hebrew. So we do have some completely new unknown texts, <coughs> but that's not the strength of the project, I would say. I must say, and I admit it, that uh, most of the fragments that we find are yet another fragment of the Talmud, yet another fragment, Torah scroll, yet another. Lots, about 50%, half of them are liturgical fragments. So for those wor working on liturgy in medieval Europe, it's an incredible treasure. Because this is, a, a, of course, there are changes from one community to another, and it gives you this perspective. The strength of the project is not really what is new, the new texts. The strength of the project is the number, <coughs> the sheer number of the fragments. The fact that it, uh, that it increased our knowledge of the Hebrew books by 100%, because from Ashkenazi world, we have, we have about 20,000 20, medieval codices all over the world, and now we have 20,000 fragments, which used to be books. So it gives us a, a more clear idea about statistics, of what people read, <coughs> of literacy, of the spread of literacy. There are some gems, of course, but this is not, we don't have, you know, I can't say, we can't boast that we have discovered hundreds of unknown texts, no. Most of the texts are known. Uh, the versions are different, and the, and the fact, the spread of the text is different. So what is interesting, for instance, it's when you, when you take a well-defined collection and you, you work on it. For instance, Krakow, it's a good example because we know that, that they were used, these, these fragments come from the same source. They were used by the same workshop of the University of Krakow. So obviously the Hebrew manuscripts might have come from somewhere else, but it's more logical to assume that they came from the local Jewish community. And then you have 300 fragments. And then you try to see what these people read. It does give you a representative sample of what people read. Of course, there is a problem of the preservation. The manuscripts, you were talking about the archaeology. What is preserved? <coughs> How representative are these, fr these fragments of, of, the, of the general bookshelf? Well, obviously, what was preserved was what could be reused, what was worth reusing. That means large fragments. Torah scrolls, um, nice bifolios from Talmudic books. So another question is, maybe there, there are lots of things there that we, are not, that we are not getting because they were smaller, they were informal, they were bad quality books. What we get is good quality books. Mm, unless, unless we talk about these paper manuscripts, then we get everything. We get an impression that really everything was. And it is in Girona, in Spain, that we find most of the, of, of the original documents, medical texts that have been not known, scientific. For instance, in Polish or German collections, we have <coughs> even not 1% of scientific or philosophical <coughs> literature, unlike the Cairo Geniza, unlike Oriental communities. While in, in Girona, we do get medical, medical uh, documents or medical <coughs> texts or, mm, or philosophical texts. So it is also maybe the question of the format. We have to bear it in mind. But uh, yes, the strength of the project is certainly this. It's the sheer amount. It's the, the possibility of, of working on specific communities where we know, again, Poland, we know that from the 15th, 16th century, it was one of the most important communities with a, with a yeshiva founded by the, by the rabbis arriving from Prague a community which had a very, very, very important economical and, and scientific uh, intellectual role. And in fact, we have no manuscripts from medieval c Polish communities. The only manuscripts we have are the fragments. Mm. So 
it does give you the, the proof of the, so that's the strength of the project. However, we do have some, <laughs> <laughs> some, uh, some jewels, yes, and some legal documents as well, because the something where, something that, 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 that European scholars were very unhappy about and were very jealous as far as Cairo Geniza was concerned, it is the documentary content. In the Cairo Geniza, about, mm -hmm. about 10,000 fragments are documents, which are the most evident primary source for reconstructing history. In Europe, we had nothing comparable. The documents were very few, the documents we knew. The English collection was the only exception, about, about 300 uh, legal documents. But from all over Europe, we had two, three from France, a few from Germany, almost nothing, some a little bit more from Spain. And now with, the, with this project, we are really discovering account books, the books of uh, money lenders, the uh, legal documents, private letters. Uh, we have increased our corpus by, I don't know, I would say 300%. It's from five to 15, but uh, it's, still <laughs> it's still a lot. So, <clears throat> so we, we, we are getting there. there are, I think that this is a very important contribution of the project. This is the legal aspect legal and uh, economic documents, which were completely unknown. I would just add that from a curatorial perspective, especially in a, in a US library, where by definition our collections haven't been there since the 1400s, um, the provenance aspect of being able to say, um, you know, there's another, there's another fragment <coughs> that, that is part of the same manuscript at, that in France, to be able to put those two together, I can only trace the history of our collections to the 1890s. And before that, with some collections, because I know it came from a, a particular collection that can go a little bit earlier, but to be able to, to definitively say this came from this particular place in time is, is really exciting. I was curious about the manuscript that you showed with the illustrated, well not illustrated, but decorative initial word panel. And I haven't seen many, many binding, uh, many key manuscripts by it, and frequently with no concern toward orientation or, um, or aesthetics. That one particularly, and I think you said it was a, a fly leaf? Yeah. I, I'm just curious if, in this case, do you think that it was chosen because, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a pleasant aesthetic look? Or is that just the way you cropped it? Or, and, and, ha, and do you notice that, in, that there are some binders that, that make an effort to uh, either line up, uh, interesting shell show, um, I mentioned where there was a front and back, mm -hmm. both on the side, I mean, so I, I'm, I'm just curious that the, the aesthetic use of these, and especially the notarial bindings that you mentioned, sometimes they were turned inside out so the, the, the writing didn't show, and other times, is there any, is there anything we can say about the aesthetic, the aesthetics of the use of these bindings mm -hmm. to the people who are reusing them? Yeah, it's a nice thought. Um, there is no rule, I think. So in most cases, there is a complete disregard to the text. The text is upside down, the text is cut in little pieces, glued. In most cases, we can say safely that the binder did not care about the text to give information. But you're right, this one looks as if he did. <laughs> so he, he, he respected a, a, a beautiful panel. Uh, I cannot say. There is one example where a scholar, Patricia Tienemann, uh, from Paris, specialist of, uh, of illuminated Latin manuscripts, uh, worked, on, uh, worked together on a fragment from, from uh, Troyes. It is, a, it is a Hebrew Bible fragment, two fragments of the Bible, which were bound uh, in a Latin work, um, which belonged to the, to the collection of, uh, of the Count of Champagne. The, Hebrew Bible fragments are twice as long as the Latin book. But instead of cutting the fragments, the binder just folded 
polygon, I play harmonica, so we can know I'm forty, then we have the full point. And uh, Patricia said, look, he just didn't want to cut it. He was really keen on keeping the, the page as it is. So maybe it is the case, because in most cases, they are simply cut to fit the, the format of the book. But maybe in some particular cases, there was uh, a binder that said, OK, it's a nice page. Why should I keep it? It's a nice image. Let's keep it. I'd like to follow up. Are there, have you come across any Findings that are reused in Hebrew books. Yes. So, and is there any sh is any change in the treatment then? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, quite often it was as well the question of palimpsest. That was this idea that the the Jews would not destroy and reuse a Hebrew text. Bindings were often made by non Jews, even for Hebrew books. We have again from Krakow. We have a, we have a, a legal dispute between a Jewish woman who left a book to be bound by the binders of the Krakow University in the 15th century, and apparently they bound the book in such a way that two choirs were missing. Maybe they were used for <laughs> <laughs> other But we know that the Jews would just go to Christian book binders, and we know it as well from Sefer Hasidim. Uh, it is a practice which is criticized and forbidden by the Sefer Hasidim. So if Sefer Hasidim forbids something, obviously everybody does it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the logic of the thing. So, <clears throat> so we know that the Jews would use Christian, Christian binders. So we cannot say, we have indeed some Hebrew, Hebrew manuscripts in the Bibliothèque Nationale, we have three of them, with Hebrew, bindings, with Hebrew binding fragments inside. And we cannot say whether they were bound by, by the Jews or not but they are in Hebrew manuscripts. There was this idea, uh, as I said, with the palimpsest that, that the script, Hebrew script is holy, so the Jews would not desecrate it by writing over it or by destroying the page or using it. I don't know about the bindings, because as I said, maybe they were done by Christians, but uh, as far as palimpsests are concerned, from the kind of Giza, I can clearly tell you that there are at least five palimpsests in the Cairo Geniza, where the Hebrew text is written on the top of the Hebrew text by the Jews, and at least one of the reused fragments was a liturgical biblical manuscript. So the Jews would not, I mean, the, this idea of the holiness and the, you know, don't touch to my Torah scroll and these kind of things. Yes, of course, it is true, the Torah scroll goes to the Geniza and so on, but not always. We find examples of the reuse of even biblical, it was not a Torah scroll, it was Book of Kings, so Hattavot scroll, but it was a scroll which was used in the liturgy, <coughs> which was reused for a, for a Sefer Shtavot in 11th century Spain. The manuscript is in, a, in the Bodleian Library, the Geniza collection. So the Jews did use Hebrew manuscripts as well. And this happened in, in the East as well, um, if this concept of Geniza has gone up. Where they, I spoke to Ezra Shrub, <coughs> a different manuscript, but he he said, oh, it's from a binding fragment. And I said, great, it's from a binding fragment? It's, your, it's European Geniza? He said, no, no, no. It's Eastern Geniza um, binding fragments. And he said that was done ex extensively, um, mm -hmm. where they reused uh, manuscripts, where Jews reused manuscripts. Yes, I, I can sh show you this, this, this fragment from from Morocco. It comes from a Geniza. It comes from this one. It comes from the, uh, yeah, here we were working with uh, Luca Baraldi, the conservator from Italy, and my students. We were working on make, or, or taking apart all these parts of the manuscript. The manuscript was discovered in an archaeological excavation of a Moroccan Geniza in Figig, in the south, uh, southeast of Morocco. Um, when we were called by the archaeologists to come and see the Geniza, they said, we discovered medieval manuscripts, 14th century, no problem about it, please come. So obviously we rushed to Morocco immediately to discover that all the manuscripts are from the end of the 19th and <laughs> the beginning of the 20th century. But it was also important for the archaeologists to realize that maybe the Geniza itself and maybe, maybe the building is not as old as they thought. So it was also extremely important. 
And among the, among the manuscripts in the, in the Geniza of the Synagogue of Pekin, <coughs> we have found a book, book binding with 19th century fragments in it. So indeed, this was a practice of Islamic world. Mm -hmm. and, but these are specific book bindings. So what is, these are these, this, as I told you, these cardboard book bindings that Michel has shown as well. This was, uh, this was called the Morish, Moresco type of bindings. They were usually made by taking a leather, part, piece of leather or skin or parchment, what you have shown, it was the bifolio of the parchment glued together. And then the pieces of, of paper were glued on top of this, of this, uh, uh, of this leather or parchment to create this cardboard we spoke about. Um, and indeed, that was practiced in all Muslim countries. So in, in uh, Persia, also in Yemen, there are lots of fragments coming from Yemen from, from these kind of bindings, and in Morocco, as well in Egypt. Some of the Geniza fragments come from bindings as well. Mm. So this we know, uh, quite a lot of fragments in the collection of Alliance Israelite Universelle come from the Geniza, but from the bindings, because the bindings would, would end up in a Geniza as well. So there is a moment that where Geniza and reuse in the bindings come together, after all. Uh, so this was the, 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 the way of reusing manuscripts in, is in the Islamic world. That's why, as far as Europe is concerned, this way of reuse is attested in Spain, south, but especially what we know, it's the north of Spain, Catalonia, and in southern France. Uh, we have as well some examples from Italy, but this way of making, uh, making uh, bindings is not attested in the north, not in England, not in Germany, not in Eastern Europe. It's really specific to the Islamic world and southern, southern mm -hmm. Europe. shown us a photograph where a conservator tries to touch them. And my question actually concerns the material, of course, because I'm coming from conservation, very interested in technique and technology, but also the kind of future life of those works uh, or, the, or those objects. Um, when we think of them as entities, you know, and the issue of biography, I think it's quite interesting concept here. Um, so they are having some kind of identity and they were manuscripts in the libraries, mm -hmm. they stay in the books where they still are. Uh, we are not moving them, we simply make them available through the, through the, the modern possibilities, through the database. But a good example are the, the fragments which are detached, and this is what, what you mean. So the ones that we actually take out of the bindings, like these fragments here. Then you have two possibilities. What happens in Girona? Girona is an archive, it's not a library. So the fragments which are detached receive their own independent shelf mark, which has a relation, which is related to the shelf mark of the notarial file from which it was taken. It is put in a box, it is conserved, of course, described, photographed. Uh, it, is, it is put in, in, specific, uh, in specific wrappers with non-acidic paper to protect them. They are very carefully protected. And then they remain as, uh, as archival items. Through the catalog, through the database, you can, of course, refer to them. But the display, of course, they can be displayed, but they can be displayed during specific exhibitions. And most of these, uh, of these collections, when they realize that they have important Hebrew fragments, they do organize exhibitions. This is happening just now in Colmar. Mm. In a few days, there is going to be an exhibition in Colmar 
uh, of the fragments that we have discovered that we have worked on. So, of course, they are, they are, uh, they are available. An interesting case is this one, it's Morocco. We have found, we have found a binding, um, Hebrew manuscripts, in a place, in a synagogue which was abandoned by the Jews in 1954. That's the time when the Jewish community of Figig emigrated to Israel, United States, and especially to France. Um, in order to, to preserve, to conserve this, uh, this manuscript, we took it out to France with the special permission, of course, of the government. We have done all this work of conservation. Uh, we have put it on the website, which is not on books, within books website because it's a different project, but it is uh, all, the f all the images are available. Um, we have described them, cataloged them, and then we have sent them back to Morocco. So uh, the fragments, as far as I know, are now in the, in the town hall of the little town of Figuig. And the idea is that one day there is going to be a museum where they will be displayed. But what will happen, how it will happen, whether it will happen, I don't know. But that's true, yes, there is, of course, there is, there is this life afterwards. Of course, there is, first of all, from our point of view, what is important is to give them an existence as numbers, images, descriptions, catalog descriptions, and to make them available for scholarly research, but also for people who, who have initiative to, dis to display them. It's also possible. Once this first uh, first step that we are doing is uh, is uh, is done, <laughs> but it's uh, it's not a part of our project in a way. We can make it happen, but uh, it is the, the the initiative of the keepers of the collection with whom we work. Mm -hmm. And a, te a technique question, perhaps? Could you comment on that a little bit more? The materials used. You said that a certain type of object allows for detachment mm -hmm. as opposed to, to yeah. the books that are produced, for instance, uh, nowadays that turn into yeah. pulp under the kind of influence of water mm -hmm. and so yes. forth. So is it a special um, technique that? Uh, of paper making right. in the Middle Ages, it was not made of the same material. Paper today is, is made uh, mainly mainly from reused books, <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. but, uh, but paper is made from, from wood, while, while medieval paper is made from fabric. And uh, it, it, simply, it simply relates differently. The fibers relate very differently. And once you, you put them in water, it, 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 it makes them younger. It actually is good for them, for conservation of medieval paper. It is a rejuvenating bath for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there is, uh, they simply don't disintegrate. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. probably because they are made of a completely different, different material at, uh, mm -hmm. at the beginning. You know that in the Middle Ages there were, there were people going from village to village and, and buying old clothes, um, rugs. Mm -hmm. uh, it was to make paper. scientists about using the iron and the ink to scan 
the manuscripts under layers of leather to reveal the, the manuscripts that are there. So I'm curious, with your project and avenues for future funding, are you looking at ways to develop technology to improve your ability to do things like that? Yes, certainly. Because you see, when the project, our project, Book Reading Book, starts in 2009, it is a network of the projects. Some of them existed many years before, like the Italian project started by Cernomenta almost 30 years ago, continued by Mamo Terani for, for, for years. Mm, and some of the projects, the idea behind the project was to detach the fragments. Mm -hmm. So most of the funding for the project <laughs> went actually into taking the fragments out of the bindings. Uh, fortunately, in modern times, they kept the, they kept the note mm -hmm. of the bindings. However, since the creation of our project, it was mostly my, my idea, because as, a, as, as someone who is interested in the history of the book, I take the book as a whole. It's not the binding, it's part of the, of the life of this book. Mm -hmm. And they have to be considered together. Mm -hmm. So as I told you, we take the manuscript mm -hmm. from the binding, first of all. Right. You work on the history of the binding from the fragments. Mm -hmm. This is a collaboration, yes. and it has to be, it has to be like that. So, uh, so as you say, the idea is not to rip them apart not to take the, uh, the, the, the fragments out of the binding. It happens, as I told you, only when reading. We cannot see on the other side, and the text justifies it. Mm -hmm. A commentary or a text that, that doesn't exist. And when the, the collection was going anyway to do some conservation work on the manuscript. Mm -hmm. So it is also, it must be said, <coughs> it's also an extremely expensive procedure so when the manuscript is taken apart, we, we have to look for uh, 1,500 euros to recreate, to restore the binding for one book. So obviously, that's, uh, that, that's the funding is extremely important when we want to, 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 to make this work. As far as the paper manuscripts are concerned, this cardboard, it wouldn't probably be possible to see through 40 or 50 layers. Maybe, we haven't tried. We haven't tried yet. But as far as, as, uh, as the binding, you know, single layer bindings are concerned, indeed the, 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 the X-ray is a wonderful, uh, wonderful technology and it can be used, and it is used. So we work, we work especially with the Institute for, for Materials in Berlin, with uh, Ira Rabin, who specializes in, uh, in the analysis of uh, parchments, inks, uh, for, for the purpose of conservation, uh, to discover new methods of reading through the layers mm -hmm. of, uh, of manuscripts, but also to, to, to discover new, new ways of uh, analyzing the ink and uh, the parchments, which is extremely important. It may be one day it will be as well a new way of dating the manuscripts. So yes, we work with uh,
sometimes it's uh, quite quite interesting because because the revolution and the change in the, in the archival system uh, books were moved centralized so it is a little bit easier because sometimes especially as far as the north is concerned you will find books from different monasteries from different places in one in one library say or in one archive in the south of france it's a little bit different so there are there are more more local municipal archives, which still contain very rich medieval medieval uh, collections. And then we went there as well. So we worked in Toulouse, for instance, we have, uh, we have had someone who opened all the archival registers in Toulouse. And we didn't find one single <laughs> Hebrew fragment, which was frustrating, but at least the work has been done. And uh, similar work was done in Marseille, Avignon, Cavalion, all these small places where there were Jewish communities in the, in the Middle Ages. And sometimes we find the one, like in Cavalion, two or three fragments only after a month's work. But we, it has been done yeah. as well. But the deep collections are, are easily, definitely. The one which hasn't been studied is, um, you know, the place in Italy which has been studied quite well is Emilia Romagna, the north, the Bologna region, because Mauro Perani and his team worked mostly on this region. And since they had in one region about 10,000 fragments, so they didn't move uh, out of the space separately. But the, the region of the Marte is extremely rich as well. We know, for instance, that in Urbino, there are about 500 Hebrew fragments in one collection. That would be the next move as well. Yeah. I think because of the time, we must close, but we'd love to thank our speakers for introducing such a meaningful collaboration and sharing. blog and an entire website devoted to the cultures of cultivation on the BGC website so please um, um, yeah be referred to this and also if any of you are on watching us online miss any of our other talks we have an online archive so please check also that thank you so much and thanks for thank you